Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or indeed good morning or good evening, depending on where you are as you join us today for Latrobe Financial's quarterly investor call briefing for the quarter ending 31 March 2016. It's a real pleasure to have you with us here today. I'm Chris Andrews, Chief Investment Officer here at Latrobe Financial. And it's terrific to see the numbers joining us today across Australia and, and indeed internationally. Um, many repeat attendees, so thank you for your continued support and interest. A few points of housekeeping before we begin. Now these sessions are designed to encourage questions. I'd really like you to send any questions through to me. You should be able to see on screen where you can type your questions. I'll answer as many as I can at the end of the formal presentation and that'll be on a first come, first served basis. Now, given the numbers we've got today, I might not be able to get to all of you. I will finish this session promptly at 12.30, but I will follow up individually with anyone that I've missed. So please send through any questions that you might have. I should also point out that I won't be commenting on individual portfolios or assets today. That's not the purpose of this investor call briefing. As always, our investor sales team is ready to assist you on these matters at our free call national number, 1800 818 818. As a final point, I'll note that for FBAA members seeking the 0.5 CPD points for today's briefing, please email us at marketing at latrobefinancial.com.au and we'll send the CPD confirmation code to you later on today. So on that note, let us begin. Today's investor call will provide you with our current view, the Latrobe financial view of the key issues driving investment opportunities for you at the moment. First, we'll look at the macroeconomic landscape, both domestically and globally. Secondly, we will update you on the Australian property market, always a topic of interest. Thirdly, we'll provide an update on Latrobe financial. And finally, we'll review the quarterly performance of our $1.1 billion Latrobe Australian credit fund investment options. So let's start with our headwinds and tailwinds report, which is of course our macro view of the domestic and global economies. And our first headwind that we'll look at today is of course the China story, which is continuing. In our last investor call briefing, we discussed China at some length and there are still risks emanating from the Middle Kingdom. This quarter, we'll take a look at the much discussed Chinese debt situation. Now everyone agrees that China has a debt problem. We, you know, we're looking at government, household and non-financial corporate debt sitting at around 260% of GDP at the end of 2015. What's more, this debt is growing rapidly. It's been increasing by almost 100 percentage points since the GFC. And that's of course as the Chinese government has embarked on expansionary fiscal and monetary policies to stimulate growth. It's projected, in fact, if anything, to accelerate further in 2016. Now, to this point, this debt has been financed by high domestic savings from the Chinese banking sector. As we all know, the Chinese have a very strong culture of savings, but an increasing share of new debt being issued is being used to service existing debt, and that's plainly unsustainable. Now, no one knows where a trigger point for a debt crisis is, but if banks run out of liquidity and have to rely on wholesale funding, or if there are large capital outflows, for example, that persist for a prolonged period, China will become subject more to international market forces. And that's the sort of scenario that could result in a hard landing for the Chinese economy. Now, at this stage, the unique characteristics of the Chinese economy, obviously, we, we're all aware of the strong capital controls they have in place. As I mentioned before, the high, cult, the high savings rate, which is uh, been a part of the Chinese culture for decades. And of course, government ownership of key assets and, and enterprises, that gives China plenty of ammunition to manage debt levels carefully, to uh, restructure debt where appropriate, to retire in an orderly fashion bad debts that are sitting in the system. Now that of course will weigh on short-term growth, but it would restore a more sustainable long-term growth trajectory and certainly uh, bring the debt trajectory back into line. Now the March Chinese growth print is actually very interesting in this context. Chinese economic growth actually rebounded sharply after a slow start to 2016. Exports grew 11.5% year on year and headline economic growth actually stabilised at 6.7% year on year. 
a range of statistical prints are now leading many economists to re revise their projections of Chinese growth upwards, and this is the first upward revision for Chinese growth in some time. However, an important part of this acceleration in growth was strong credit expansion, which of course takes us right back to the debt discussion and the headwind for Australian investors. For the resources related sector, which of course hitched its wagon to the Chinese growth story through the noughties, conditions are challenging. We all know that, we've heard that, with commodity prices well below their levels of recent years. Now, this has obviously led to a further significant decline in the earnings of resource related companies, including the BHPs and Rios of the world, as the graph on screen shows. Perhaps the oil and gas sector has been the most particularly affected, the earnings of listed oil and gas companies in fact fell by more than 40% in 2015, a really extraordinary fall. Smaller companies in all, se in all sectors across the, resources, uh, across the resources sector are struggling to cut costs and operations at higher cost mines continue to be suspended. A particularly revealing metric when you look at the resources sector is the capacity of resource related companies to service their debt. Excluding BHP and Rio, which are obviously the lowest cost producers, they've got the lowest cost base, they've got the strongest balance sheet, so if you exclude those two companies, net interest expenses absorbed more than one quarter of resource producers earning in 2015. This is an extraordinary level and is despite current low interest rate. This really shows the extent of the earnings decline that's hitting the sector and the effect that this decline can have on resources businesses. So that's a real headwind for the Australian economy. The third headwind, well household indebtedness and the debt to disposable income ratio, well that's continued to climb from what have been already high levels as households take on more debt but also importantly as income growth has slowed. Now this measure can be looked at, looked at in a number of ways. Later we'll see the debt to raw income figure which shows a less dramatic increase but the underlying trend is certainly upwards and is certainly towards record levels. Why is this a headwind? Okay, there are of course a few reasons. First, high levels of indebtedness means that borrowers are increasingly vulnerable to stress events. Now that could be interest rate rises, which I know we believe are unlikely, but also other stress events like unemployment. Secondly, and even in the absence of these stress events, the rate of indebtedness simply cannot keep increasing forever. At some point, you know, and that's whether it's now, whether it's next week, whether it's in 10 years time, borrowers will have to begin repaying the debt. And when they do, at an aggregate level, when they do, the economy will feel it in the form of decreased spending that will result in lower economic growth and probably also in, dec in decreasing asset prices. Now this deleveraging, as was the situation with China, this can result in a hard landing or a recession type scenario or in a soft landing with positive but still subpar growth. Either scenario is a negative for investors. Now we've had economists and we've heard perhaps and we've, we've discussed economists like Stephen Keane and their, uh, their commentary over the years. They've been arguing the bearish or the hard landing case for some years now. Their singular focus on debt levels has at times led them astray in a number of ways, not least in the prediction of house price behaviour, but their fundamental point about dealing with levels of household indebtedness is on point. The final headwind for this quarter is the apparent risk in some areas of Australia's property market, and in fact this issue was considered at length in the April Reserve Bank of Australia RBA Financial Stability Review. At the heart of the concern behind this headwind is the significant, so it's both significant and geographically concentrated growth in supply of new apartments. Now that's in Sydney, it's in Melbourne, uh, Brisbane, Perth, and this is all due for completion over the next few years. This new supply may well weigh on prices and rents in these areas. If that occurs, investors will need to service their mortgages while earning lower rental income, and of course households facing difficulties may not be able to resolve their situation by selling the property, at least so easily. There may be a delay in property sales and that puts stress on everyone. Now the Reserve Bank argues that risks for developers of these apartments have increased in recent times, uh, with demand for apartments softening in some areas, particularly in Brisbane and Perth, with households facing tighter access to credit, as we'll discuss in a few moments. 
settlement failures could well increase and a downturn in apartment markets would obviously weaken the financial health of the developers involved. One key question that's receiving a lot of attention is the extent to which demand for these properties is underpinned by Chinese purchases, particularly overseas purchases generally, but Chinese purposes in particular in the current environment. If this is significant, and if Chinese demand were to decline significantly, this could weigh on domestic property prices and potentially even hit bank balance sheets and domestic investors as well. Now the Reserve Bank's clearly uncertain about the significance of this issue. As we've discussed in previous investor call briefings, the data on foreign purchases is both incomplete and unsatisfactory. The RBA concedes that non-resident Chinese buyers own only a small portion of the Australian housing stock, but also argue, and uh, quote industry sources for this, that, they, that, that these purchases account for a significant and increasing share of purchases, particularly for central off-the-plan off type apartments. What's more, Foreign Investment Review Board approvals for non-resident purchases have increased substantially in recent years as the graph on screen shows. Now, if this demand were to slow suddenly and dramatically, developers could be put under real stress. So what are the triggers for this sort of slowdown? Well, they vary, but could include a hard economic landing in China, uh, increased outbound capital controls in China, uh, but also regulatory responses to perceived, um, perceived issues in this area here in Australia. Now, to that end, the National Australia Bank's Residential Property Index shows foreign demand for Australian residential property at its lowest level in two and a half years, and that's in the first quarter of 2016. Chief Economist Alan Oster attributes this fall to the introduction of tighter legislation around foreign purchases, so it actually could be that the steam's already coming out of this segment of the market. Taking all of this into account, our view is that this risk while real, is manageable under most scenarios. It applies to a very focused segment of the market and a substantial impact depends on some very significant trigger events. Okay, so that in a nutshell is the headwinds affecting the Australian economy. Let's now turn to the tailwinds, those things driving positive outcomes for investors. And the first headwind is unemployment. Pundits were surprised when Australia's seasonally adjusted unemployment rate unexpectedly fell to 5.7% in March. Now that was down from 5.8% in February and uh, well it was it was a very strong result compared to market expectations which were for an increase to 5.9%. It's the lowest jobless rate since September 2013. You've got the economy adding 26,100 jobs, a really terrific result. We've got the number of unemployed decreasing by 7,300. Now let's put this in some sort of historical context. The unemployment rate in Australia has averaged 6.95% from 1978 to 2016. It reached its high of 11.1% in October 1992 and on the flip side it's low of 4% and that was back in February 2008. In that context, an unemployment print of 5.7% coming down from 5.8%, 5.8% is a strong headwind, a strong tailwind for our economy. And might I add, it, it goes a substantial way towards giving lie to the pervasive negativity that we've been reading and hearing about our economy for years. Really terrific result there. So that's a very strong tailwind for the Australian economy. The second tailwind continues to be our record low interest rates. We've talked before about the stimulatory effect that they can have on an economy and the graph on screen shows how this can work. Despite our record levels of household indebtedness, interest payments as a percentage of disposable income are at their lowest levels since 2003. So that's the bottom quadrant of the graph on screen, bottom left hand quadrant of the graph on screen. Almost half or around half of total uh, household debt in Australia in fact is owed by households in the top income quintile. Now that's a pattern that's broadly consistent across the states uh, and that suggests that debt of course is owed by those households who are most able to service it, so that's a good result. Finally, when you take into account uh, what they call aggregate mortgage buffers, what are they? They're things like balances in offset accounts, redraw facilities and the like. 
they continue to grow strongly, a real feature of the Australian market that's only now starting to get the attention that it deserves, and they're sitting at around 17% of outstanding loan balances. If you put that in context, that's more than two and a half years of scheduled repayments at current interest rates. Now, there remains, as there always is, a number of households more exposed to financial stress. That's obviously those households with lower net wealth, lower income and or higher leverage. Obviously these households are likely to have lower buffers or, or, or indeed not to have buffers at all and to be more exposed to adverse and stress events. But overall, the Australian borrower is benefiting significantly in the current low interest rate environment. What's more, at an aggregate level again, we are seeing the effects of some of the strong regulatory action taken in late 2014 and into 2015. Now you'll recall that the regulators, primarily the Reserve Bank and APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, who regulate Australia's banks, insurers, superannuation funds, but specifically here the banks, they express concerns at the growth of the investor loan segment as a proportion of the total loan market. They also expressed some concern at some of the credit criteria being applied by some lenders at the margins. Now, in response to those concerns, a raft of changes were introduced, in, and, and that included increased interest rates on investor loans, uh, reductions in the discounts applying to those investors, stricter loan serviceability assessment criteria, and that applied in fact across all types of housing lending. And the effects of this tightening are now apparent, and they're apparent in data on the characteristics of housing loan approvals, and again, they're shown nicely by the graph on screen. Over the second half of 2015, the shares of owner-occupied and investment lending at high loan-to-value ratios, or LVRs, greater than 90%, they declined materially, and the share of interest-only lending also fell, particularly for investors. The average size of loan approvals is now lower than a few month ago, months ago, and that's consistent with the reduced availability of high LVR loans and also tighter serviceability standards. Uh, to test the efficacy of this regulatory action, APRA has run a series of hypothetical tests against, against lenders' credit criteria, both before and after the changes were introduced. Now, the second series of tests, which were conducted last September, they found that the maximum loan size fell by around 12% for investors, a very substantial fall, and by around 6% for owner occupiers. That is a really material additional buffer being built every day into Australia's housing system. It's fair to say that in leading these changes, there's a sense that the regulators are looking to be ahead of the cycle. They're looking to head off potential issues before they affect the performance of the borrowing market. And if you look at the graph on screen right now, you can see that there's no indication of declining asset performance as we sit at the moment. With the steps in place to build, in fact, more conservatism into the broader Australian lending market, at the moment, we're very comfortable with the profile of Australia's credit system. So that takes us to the final tailwind, uh, and low interest rates also gave significant assistance to the business sector. Now we've talked about the struggles of the resources related sector in reviewing the headwinds for Australia's economy, but the other 90% of businesses are experiencing some decent tailwinds at the moment. We've got survey measures of business conditions well above their long run averages. We've got business loan performance continuing to improve. We've got business failure rates relatively low by historical standards. The large depreciation of the Aussie dollar since mid-2014 has also supported businesses in a number of industries. And when you add the decline in oil and other commodity prices, these generally benefit companies outside the resources sector. And that's a point you recall we made in our last investor call briefing, and which we're, we're pleased to see is being taken up a little bit more broadly in discussions now. When you focus on the effects of low interest rates on the non-resource related business sector, the aggregate debt servicing ratios of businesses in Australia is now around historical lows. That's a substantial tailwind for, their, for our economy. It reduces the cost base of our non-resource related businesses and it creates headroom for, inv for investment where appropriate. So that's the headwinds and tailwinds report for this quarter. We're about to move into an extended election campaign, so we're going to hear a lot of commentary and argumentation over the next few months. In our view, if you strip away the rhetoric, the positives greatly outweigh the negatives, and investors would do well to remember that. 
should just also give a quick update on our well-known prediction about interest rates. Back in September 2014, we predicted that interest rates would remain within 50 basis points of the prevailing rate at that time, 2.5% per annum. As you can see, we're still very much in the money. Uh, as at last night, the ASX 30-day interbank cash rate futures indicated just a 16% expectation of interest rate decrease at the next RBA meeting, so we're going to stick with our call. But I note we've also just had uh, a, an inflation print which has uh, surprised um, surprised most economists. So the ABS has reported that um, core inflation is down and is now sitting at 1.55% per annum. That's well below the RBA's uh, target range of 2 to 3%. It was driven largely by decreases in the price of food and petrol. Um, the Australian dollar has automatically responded to that with a decrease of 1%. Obviously, that may put pressure on the Reserve Bank um, or at least create space for the Reserve Bank to make an adjustment in, in, in interest rates. So we will wait and see what happens next week. Uh, but for now, we're going to stick very much with our call on interest rates. So watch this space. Turning to the Australian property market, and we start again with that very powerful chart from our friends at CoreLogic about residential real estate in Australia. Latrobe Financial was founded on the premise that residential real estate is really a fundamental and key driver of personal wealth for ordinary Australians. When you look at it, residential real estate dwarfs in value the Australian share market, uh, even the entire superannuation savings of the nation. So it's a really powerful bedrock for the Australian economy. And what's more, the importance it plays in how wealth has been enduring and consistent. This is not a new phenomenon. Over half of household wealth has been invested in residential real estate consistently for decades. At Latrobe Financial, we've got 60 years experience in investing in property credit. So that's loans to borrowers secured by a mortgage. In itself, that's an extraordinarily powerful asset class. It's got well over 1.4 trillion invested in the residential segment alone and 30 billion in new investable opportunities each and every month. So that's the, that's the asset pool from which we derive our own portfolios here at Latrobe Financial. Um, obviously, in that context, house price is a perennial hot topic and one on which we get a lot of queries, so uh, hence the update on the property market here from our perspective. On screen, you can see capital gains across Australia's combined capital cities. National capital growth figures continue to be in line with our predictions. I'm pleased to say growth continues but has moderated and is now at its lowest level since September 2013. And that's reflecting in slightly lower average home loan sizes. Now, whilst the change is small, as the graph on screen shows, it's worth observing and commenting on. We've got a long history on screen here of average home loan sizes, and you can see that there have been relatively few periods of correction over the last two and a half decades. The fact that both first home buyer and non-first home buyers are affected is also very significant. And hence the impact, of course, on house price growth. The picture is different, obviously, at a city by city level, very differentiated. Sydney was once the boom capital. Well, it slowed considerably from as high as 16.2% year on year to 7.4% year on year in March. Melbourne is now the sub undisputed leader of house price growth, but it's also slowed substantially. And you can see it's, it was as high as 14.2% year on year in the September quarter, and it's down to 9.8% year on year in March. The other end of the spectrum, Perth and Darwin, continue to be negative. The rest of the capital cities broadly are recording low single digit growth figures. Obviously, behind those numbers in the regions and also within the, the, the suburbs and streets within these cities, some properties perform better than others. That's why it's always important that purchasers look beyond, beyond the headlines. Don't look at property as one single undifferentiated market. You can take advantage of tools like CoreLogic's propertyvalue.com.au to assist you in assessing an individual property. The most important thing is that you are not fooled by headline growth figures. Each and every property is different. Looking to the future, auction clearance rates, which is an important leading indicator of underlying market dynamics, they rebounded actually quite strongly in the March quarter, but are still well below the circa 80% levels seen last year. And as we discussed, following the intervention of APRA last year, investment loans have retreated considerably as a proportion of new housing finance commitments in Australia. 
So if you look at the demand supply fundamentals, obviously you can see the gap narrowing, although it's, it's just flared out a little um, over the last month or so. Approvals are coming off their peak in late 2015, and all of this points to a housing market in which, on average, house price growth will continue to be positive, but perhaps moderate in comparison to recent boom times. Obviously, as I've said, at a micro level, at an individual property level, it will continue to be a very diverse picture. So that's the property outlook. Now let's turn to the Latrobe Financial Group update, and it's been another terrific quarter for the Latrobe Financial Group. All key metrics are positive. Funds under management has grown strongly both at a retail and a group level. Group funds under management are quickly approaching the $3 billion mark. Group revenue for the financial year to date continues to accelerate quarter on quarter as funds under management grows. And group equity is also at record levels at 106.8 million. Again, this reflects the commitment of the shareholders to the long-term future of Latrobe Financial. And that takes us to the detail of our retail investment offerings, the Latrobe Australian Credit Fund. Remembering as usual that our fund is not a bank deposit and has different risk return characteristics and noting as we do that past performance is not a guarantee of future performance, you can get a sense of the fund's profile by looking at the key indicators on screen. And we'll focus first on the cash and mortgages option, or CMO. It's currently outperforming the benchmark by 1.2% per annum. Now, when you've got a weighted average LVR, uh, loan to value ratio across the portfolio of 63.7%, you've got 90 day plus arrears of 1.2%, it's a very strong profile for investors. Our pool mortgages option also continues to pr produce its stellar performance profile. Obviously, uh, you can see on screen some of the awards and ratings it's hold very well recognised for its enduring performance for investors. Got close to 600 million in funds under management and is outperforming its benchmark by a whopping 130 basis points. That's 1.3% per annum. With arrears of just 1.5%, and when you talk about a portfolio with 1,421 individual first mortgage loans, it's a powerful offering for investors. Obviously maintains those ratings, is in fact the highest rated fund in the sector in Australia. When you look at the pool mortgages options uh, performance for investors on an accumulation basis, you can see that since inception, way back in October 2002, the pool mortgages option has mixed it with the best of the alternative asset classes, and uh, and it's done it without the volatility seen in other asset classes and the timing and sequence risk issues that these introduce. Given the volatility we're seeing across markets at the moment, this has been highly attractive to investors. Uh, and I just note that that's what you see on screen is the headline rate on a net basis, so net of fees. Then we've got the select mortgages option, Australia's largest and most robust portfolio of peer-to-peer -peer investments. We've been managing these obviously for more than two decades uh, and um, our platform provides terrific peer-to-peer -peer functionality for investors, produces terrific results. Uh, we'll have more enhancements coming in the months ahead. I should note that the peer-to-peer -peer option continues to be the only independently rated peer-to-peer -peer offering in the market, so that's a very powerful plus for investors. For the more experienced peer-to-peer -peer investor, our high yield options attracting a lot of attention, currently got 60.5 million under management, predominantly mezzanine loans and mezzanine RMBS notes, which obviously offer strong yields, but backed by very diversified, highly diversified portfolios. So that's the nutshell summary of the fund. We turn to our Q&A, just time for a couple today. If I turn to them, and the first one we can see is from Ken, and it's about, uh, if I read the paragraph, okay, so we're talking about arrears and asset performance. How do we see that um, moving ahead? Well, look, um, Ken, in a nutshell, arrears levels across the economy, and we saw that from the graph I showed earlier on the screen, are stable. Uh, there's been a slight uptick in some parts of the market, you know, looking at the RMBS, they're showing a slight uptick, but that's still not forming any sort of material trend. Um, if you remember, of course, that lenders in Australia are bound by um, some pretty strict criteria around making loans, particularly residential loans to individuals under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act, which is the successor to the Uniform uh, Credit Code. Uh, those obligations are to ensure that a loan's not unsuited for a borrower's purpose and also that the borrower is able to meet their obligations without undue hardship. If you take into account the serviceability changes recently introduced, so lenders have got to have a minimum, uh, APRA regulated lenders and the TROBE um, follows this, um, have got to have 
a, a, a minimum buffer in serviceability of a 2% increase in interest rates. So a borrower has got to be able to meet their obligations assuming a 2% increase in interest rates. When you have a look at the decrease of low LVR loans, which we are really pleased to see, it's not a space, high LVR loans are not a space that uh, the Trove Financial um, plays in. Um, if you have a look at the macro picture in terms of low interest rates, low unemployment, we're seeing a very benign environment for lenders and for asset performance at the moment. So Ken, that's your question there. Uh, we've got time for one more. Uh, Risha is asking about the effect of low interest rates on savers. Risha, that is a great point. Uh, we've discussed it in previous investor calls, so I'll be really, I'll, I'll be quite quick here, but it's a very fundamental point. Low rates borrow, benefit borrowers, but they do it at the, at the um, expense of savers. Uh, for savers, low interest rates can have a significant impact on lifestyle, uh, they can have a significant impact on retirement plans. If sustained, they can have a serious macro uh, effect on an economy. Now realistically in an environment of sustained low interest rates, which is where we think we are, whether or not we uh, prove to win our bet or not, uh, we think there's a sustained period of low interest rates ahead. Uh, <clears throat> in investors really have no choice but to look for alternative sources of yield. Obviously bank deposits are not going to generate the real returns that are required. Fixed income's got some risks. There's been a lot of talk about the, the bond bubble thematic, so that's been a discussion ongoing in fixed interest markets. Obviously uh, some investors chose equities, um, dividend yield from equities investments as a, as, a, as a way of generating income, but obviously that exposes their portfolio to volatility volatility and also the, well as investors in BHP would say, they is, would, would attest the discretionary nature of dividends which can be very healthy one year and then slash the next. We're convinced that in this context our credit fund provides an important part of the answer for many investors. You know, whether you're investing in our portfolio through the pool mortgages option, our own model portfolio there, or whether you're investing through peer-to-peer -peer options and tailoring a portfolio that meets your own needs our credit fund can produce um, really powerful returns for investors in an environment where this is exactly the sort of performance profile that's needed. Now look, that's all I have time for now. I apologise to those I haven't got to, but as I've said, I will, I will follow up with you, but um, I'm two minutes over time, so I better wind things up. From all of the team at Latrobe Financial, always appreciate your interest and support. Really happy to take any questions that you might have on any of the issues we've discussed today. It's been a great quarter for Latrobe Financial and for our investors. But most importantly, our commitment is that we are looking forward to continuing to deliver for our investors and for our borrowers and brokers, our financial advisors in the challenging months ahead. So that's a commitment that you can hold us to. On that note, thanks for your attendance. Make sure you read these very important legal disclaimers on the final page. Whatever markets you're in, we hope it's profitable. Bye for now.